Welcome to the Grateful American Radio Show, hosted by author and publisher David Bruce Smith. What did George Washington do that you might not know about? What did Abe Lincoln know that could change the way you think about the Civil War? You'll learn about all that and more on this special show designed to restore excitement in American history. Let's get started. John Gray has been the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History since July 23, 2012. He oversees 234 employees, a budget of more than $34 million, and the renewal of the museum's 120,000-square-foot West Exhibition Wing. I'm Hope Katz-Gibbs, executive producer of the Grateful American series, and I am here with David Bruce Smith, the founder of the Grateful American Foundation at the Smithsonian. We are thrilled to be interviewing John. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much for coming to the Smithsonian. So before we launch into our Q&A, I want to tell our audience more about you. Prior to this job, John Gray spent much of his career in banking and government service until he became the director of the Autry Museum of Western Heritage in Los Angeles. There, he enlarged the museum's mission and scope, and in 2002, merged the museum with Colorado's Women of the West Museum. Then in 2004, with Los Angeles's oldest museum, the Southwest Museum of the American Indian. It's very impressive work. So let's get started on what you're doing here at the Smithsonian. First and foremost, what is the Smithsonian doing to help people, especially kids, get more interested in American history? Well, American history is absolutely interesting. It's the most fascinating thing anybody could ever try to understand. So the question is, how do you position it so it is engaging and attractive to anyone, kids, adults, or whatever? And at the museum, we have decided that the great American ideas and ideals can be presented in a way that's engaging and brings people in. That's in contrast to telling history on a strictly chronological basis. So what we try to do is have larger ideas like American business. How did that develop? Presented through chronology, but the reality is people are drawn in because it interests them initially, and then they go through and understand more of American history. Can you take us through a walking tour? So you walk through this beautiful entrance, and what do you see when you come into this museum, and what, would, what do you hope people learn by the time they leave? Well, we house the greatest national collection of American history here. And so we can present this collection around all the great moments in American history. So when you walk in, assuming you come in from the mall, the first thing you can go see is the great Star-Spangled Banner. And that was America's symbol of resilience, but also at the very start of how we became a nation. And it represents the War of 1812, which a lot of people don't know about, but was very important in how we created an organization, a government, that brought all the states together to defend our shores and ultimately create the great nation. So you walk in, you see this extraordinary flag, 200 years old today, that is still symbolically and actually a wonderful symbol of America. From there, you can make a decision. Are you interested in American presidency? Are you interested in the price of freedom? Are you interested in how mobility created America across, across the country? Are you interested in first ladies' dresses, which are enormously popular? And for instance, first ladies' dresses, unbelievable fashion, culture, beauty. But what it really is, is how every four years we can change administrations and we celebrate it through a huge set of inaugural parties. And it's gone on in terms of tradition for hundreds of years. It's probably the most reassuring symbol of our democracy. Statistics show that there seems to be historical illiteracy in this country, which is probably a generational issue, a multi-generational issue. So although I, I agree with everything you say, I'm curious, in order to determine what it is that kids, kids especially, want to see in the Smithsonian, does the Smithsonian ever have focus groups with kids to find out what they, what they think 
not what adults think they think, but what kids really think. We have taken a really aggressive approach trying to understand what people are interested in, in particularly students, and an aggressive approach to try to understand how they actually learn. And so it's clear from all these studies that we have to get them engaged really quickly and dynamically. And then once they're engaged, you can lead them into places where they discover for themselves what to do. Part of it is a trick of technology, having things animated and alive, but part of it is just taking the extraordinary objects and having a context around the objects which engage them. Trying not to do too much at one time is an important thing. We don't give a history lesson of American history here. You can get it if you do everything. But what we want to do is pull people in to an area in which they can become engaged, and then from there, they go on. Last week, I was at a memorial service at Mount Vernon, and one of the things I learned from a regent there was that 30 or 40 years ago, George Washington was given a chapter in a typical history book. Now Washington is given a paragraph, and Marilyn Monroe is given three pages. Mm. How do you reverse that? Because pop culture has overturned important Americans like the founding fathers and or the founding mothers or whoever you, you, know, you determine is, in, is important. Well, historical literacy is one of the great issues of America today. And we want to do all we can do to make American history more relevant to people's lives. We consciously create exhibitions and programs that start at a place in which most of our visitors enter. So as opposed to having very structured, historically-based programs that are a turnoff to some people, we try to make the lives and the stories around history deeply interesting. And we think if we do that, we can then pull people in in a larger way. I'd also say, while I agree with the lack of historical literacy, I say people are very interested in their history. And if we can come to them where they're interested, we then can capture them in a larger way around American history. So that means making it more interactive, I guess. Both more interactive, more beautiful, more engaging, and going to points of entry that they're interested in. Popular culture actually works very well for an awful lot of people. But where do you take it beyond that? You then have to take the next step. So if people are coming in to see the ruby red slippers, which they do, and it's, pretty, it's a lot of fun, you then can go just to the right and see Ben Franklin's cane and start to learn about Ben Franklin. Because in many ways, he was a popular culture figure back then. So interesting. So what, do you, what are the goals for the future of the organization? How do you plan and hope to get more people to want to gut, dive deeper, not just with pop culture, which is sprinkled throughout the museum, but with that historic reference? Well, the reality is we get 5 million visitors a year, and during the summer, spring, and fall, you can't move in this place. So we don't need more visitation at that time, but we have developed a very aggressive outreach program through education. And we really focus on two things. We focus on teacher training so that we bring three-dimensional objects and programs into the classroom through this training so they can therefore engage their students and become much more excited about that. And we also try to have direct programs that are webcast or podcast out of the building that reach around the country. We have an extraordinary new um, program that you can sign up for that teaches American history in 101 objects. We also have a way that teachers can access teaching of history through objects. Objects are inherently interesting, and if they're used effectively, it really opens up an educational front for us. Can you detect a specific time period that people are most interested in? Well, most people are interested in the lives that they know and their most recent history. Um, and while that's disconcerting to a lot of us, um, we have to make it more interesting to go back further than that. So people who walk in, depending on their age, really don't even understand, for instance, the Vietnam War, 
language for many of us was seminal in our development. And trying to engage that um, in a larger way, I'd argue that the price of freedom, which is a narrative chronological development of um, the price of freedom, is unbelievably interesting. And once people start on that, they work their whole way through and a whole world opens up for them. But what about the Civil War? I mean, that's the most unresolved con American conflict that's still, well, it's still obvious it's unresolved. Is that, does that, is that more a more popular era than most? The development of civil rights that came out of the Civil War, and next year we're doing a major uh, collaboration with Ford's Theater on the assassination of Lincoln. And so the answer is yes, and we have a great treasure trove of Lincoln, and the last Lincoln show was hugely popular. Because everything from 2011 to 2015 is a, is a 150th anniversary of something, whereas you don't get that from the Vietnam War, a 45th anniversary of something or a 50th anniversary or something. I mean, the Civil War is, is still marked by 100 years, 150 year events. It is, and we've really participated in that. What, here's an example of what we're talking about engaging people. Civil War had such an impact on the way government was financed, and the development of technology. Just two years ago, we did a symposium caused by the development of technology in the Civil War. It was the most fascinating thing you've ever seen. And people were surprised by the impact and the sort of setup that the Civil War um, caused. So in, if people are interested in technology, you can simply look to the rapid development, whether it's the use of cameras or firearms or whatever, in the Civil War. So expanding the way we look at the Civil War is very helpful to a lot of people. It's so interesting that, you know, from our perspective, our goal is to restore enthusiasm in American history. David and his family are obviously great lovers of American history. They, I think that as statistics prove that the bulk of Americans are a little bit less interested than most people who love it would, would like. So why do you attribute that to? Why do you think people don't get jazzed up about what happened in the past? Because obviously it dictates what we know and how we can move forward intelligently? Well, that's an enormously complicated question that's a very hard one to answer. I would also argue that at the Smithsonian, we find as many people interested in history as we do in the sciences. They don't define history the way I used to define it growing up, and, this, and the idea of sciences is, is broad. So I think, again, we have to go into what interests them. So the root from popular culture, like you use the ruby slippers, but uh, I would say Julia Child's Kitchen, mm -hmm. to uh, something further back might be a, uh, or her, her kitchen might catapult people back. Thank you. You've actually pulled out one of the most interesting things that's happened here with the opening of the Julia Child Kitchen. Because Julia Child is still on television in reruns, everybody knows who she is, so they come in there, it's hugely popular. If you go into the exhibition behind it, you start to see the last 50 years development around food, which is really a discussion of ethnicity, immigration, um, migration, and how people look at food. So we can use food as a portal into teaching more of American history. We just did a program on the Chesapeake Bay around food, and you start to realize what was eaten and how it was procured by native peoples and then the population that came here after that, and you really learn a lot of history. Now, do you know that every kid knows who Julia Child is? I'm not surprised. Well, no, here's when, when Meryl Streep did the Julie, mm -hmm. Julie and Julia movie five years ago, I asked my oldest, who was then 17, if she had ever heard of Julia Child and she said, Dad, everybody in my school mm -hmm. watches Julia, Julia Child. And I said, well, I thought you watched Oprah. She said, nobody watches Oprah. Mm -hmm. we, watched, we watched the cooking channel. And they see the reruns of 
the French Chef or the you know the later shows. But every kid in America knows Julia Child, and every kid in America loves food. And so, if you can use food as the way in which to engage them and go beyond that, you can do it. It sounds like a beautiful hook. Get them where they know, what they know, get them where they live, and then you can teach. It's a teachable moment. Mm -hmm. So is that the philosophy of the History Museum? It, it really is the philosophy. Um, I'd say it's a challenging one because as part of the new West Wing, we're doing a major show on democracy. And we've had all these debates about what's the most fundamental thing you can do and what's the entree for people into democracy. What we've realized is it's this idea of freedom and the essential need to participate in the government in a way that not everybody agrees with because a lot of people don't participate. I mean, our voting numbers are just abysmal. Well, how do you get more people to participate and vote? If they can understand it needs something for them, they then behave in a different way. And the history of our struggle for democracy is actually about the history of everybody in America struggling for their rights, their independence, and their freedoms. And we need to both celebrate and cherish that, but we also need to preserve that if we go forward. So our question next is, what hooked you on American history? You know, I happen to have loved my history classes when I was in, in high school. And I'm a Westerner. And the mythic West and understanding why you're there and how you're there is historic. And it's just interesting to me. And I would argue from there, the myth of America is both real and mythic. And to understand that is fascinating and really reassuring to who we are as a people today. What's your favorite period in history? It actually depends what I'm reading. That's a terrible answer. Um, I'm particularly interested in the Revolutionary War and the period after that in which the philosophy of government became an actualized practice of government. Because what we don't realize as a nation today was the unbelievable fundamental debates over how a government worked, and we ended up with a republic. And most people don't understand the difference today. And I find it fascinating to take the intellectual power of an Adams or a Madison or a Jefferson um, and how it actually ended up being our government. And that would loop in with your background. Tell our audience a little bit about where you started off of your career and how you ended up here. Actually, I've, I've, I've been very lucky. I became a banker, which was one of the most interesting things anybody could do. But if you're a really good banker, you realize that social, cultural, and history make a difference into how people behave. And the reality is, you can look at someone's history, where they came from, to see if they're going to pay you back. So I've always been inherently interested in context of people's lives and the history they've lived. Excellent. So how did you get from banking to museum work? Um, I've been lucky. I grew up in a family where museums were the most important educational tool. I'm a visual learner, so going into museums made an enormous difference for me. And out of that, I had an opportunity to go work at the Autry which is one of the most wonderful, interesting places where it really examines the convergence of Native people, Anglo people, Hispanic people, men, women, coming together. The Western story is the American story, and it was a fantastic opportunity for me. So as director of the National Museum of American History, what do you hope your legacy will be? I just hope that we have the kind of exhibitions and program that give people a context to their America that they then can be both reassured, stimulated, and challenged that they have to have an active role in their lives as American citizens. So then what that means is the new wave of immigrants in the process of, of coming in who tend to be less focused on um, assimilating than say the 1880 to 1920 group, must learn their new history. So they know who John Adams and George Washington and Alexander Hamilton and you know all the founding fathers and mothers were. Otherwise, it will, it will divide the country. 
we do a program that does a naturalization ceremony at the museum, and you really find that today's immigrants are desperate to understand America, want to become citizens, and it's a pretty extraordinary issue. I think there's a larger issue at play here beyond America, which is pulling back and becoming regionalized as opposed to global citizens, and I think we face that. But ultimately, the role of this museum is to find the commonality in how we can all be Americans. Very great. Thank you very much for your time, John Gray. We look forward to encouraging kids, parents, grandparents, and all those who love American history to visit the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. And that's it for today's episode of the Grateful American Radio Show. We will be talking to John again with Bruce Cole, who is our next interview. So we look forward to all of that. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you very, very much. We will talk to you soon. Stay tuned for more. You have been listening to the Grateful American Radio Show, hosted by author and publisher David Bruce Smith. Here's to restoring enthusiasm in history for kids and adults, too.